Hey, what's up everybody? It is Caleb and welcome to your introduction to data structures and algorithms. This is going to be a fantastic video if you're in school and you weren't paying attention or if you're trying to get a career in software development, computer science, whatever it might be. But no matter what it is, somehow you landed on this video and I'm super glad to see you here because this is going to give you all of the fundamental principles to understand algorithms and data structures. When I went through computer science school, I had a data structures and algorithms class and it seemed like every single algorithm or every single data structure I was introduced to was this entire new mountain I had to climb. Looking back, I didn't realize there were some key principles I could have learned that would have made learning all of them a whole lot easier. So if you stick with this video and also the videos in this playlist, you'll probably build that foundation such that you can learn any of the data structures or any of the algorithms with ease. Now, I still admit it is a lot of work and there's a lot to wrap your mind around, so it is going to be a challenge. But I'm going to make it easy for you guys, so let's just get started and we'll just see where we go. So first thing, why is algorithms always associated with data structures? How are they related? Well, algorithms process data. That data is stored in a data structure. That is why they are connected all of the time because it's kind of like, this does the work, this stores the data. So they need to be paired together. So algorithms, we're gonna take a look at those first, and then we're gonna take a look at data structures. So an algorithm is just a process of doing something. And we're gonna think about it really generally here, and then we'll try to get into some examples. So anytime you write code, even if it's something super simple, let's just say, all we do in our code is we just print hello. <laughs> this is like the smallest line of code you could ever possibly write. You could consider this an algorithm. Your code, what does it do? It prints hello. More than likely though, the code you write is going to be numerous lines of code. But basically, I want you to think of an algorithm as just a section of code that does something. Oftentimes, this code that we create for these algorithms will be put inside of a function. Functions are just names for a series of code that we can then call to save ourselves some time and energy. So here's an example. We might have a function sort data, and then this requires us to pass some data in. And when we do this, we will get a sorted thing of data back. What do I mean by sorted? Most likely least to greatest or alphabetical, whatever it might be. So since this does all of the work for us, we can just assign the end result to a variable. So we would have a variable sorted data and we would assign it this call here. So this is what invoking this function might look like. And now let's talk about where this data comes from. Ugh. Try and erase here. We might have a list up here or an array. And we just have some data in here. So we take this variable data, we pass it to sort data, and the end result is sorted data. Let's talk about now where the algorithm is and where the data structure is. So this would be the data structure. The algorithm is this right here. Functions make our life a whole lot easier because we don't need to worry about all of the code that actually does the sorting. And that's often what will happen when you're using Java or Python. You can just invoke different functions that do things for us. But if we're in a algorithms and data structures class, we're probably going to want to know the actual steps that are taken such that we can just call sort data and get a sorted list back. So that is where algorithms focuses. It focuses on what this function actually does. Now data structures, well, here's a simple example. I said this was a list, or you can think of it as a dynamic array. It really depends on what programming language you're going with, 
but I was thinking Python here. So we have this list and it's a way to store data. However, we just use it very easily, but behind the scenes, it needs to decide how this memory is going to be allocated, where the data is going to be stored, and so forth. So the data structures part of data structures and algorithms is learning the behind the scenes of how something like this works. How does it look inside of memory? How do we add data to this list? How do we delete data from this list? Now, when you start studying data structures and algorithms, you're gonna quickly realize that there are a ton of different options. There's so many different algorithms out there and there's so many different data structures out there. And the reason that is, is because different ones are ideal for different purposes. So as an example, this here, let's just say this is a very general list. What does that mean exactly? Doesn't really matter. But behind the scenes, this can store the data in various ways. Just as an example here, it could use a dynamic array, or it could use a linked list. These are two examples of data structures that could be used. In the case of Python, it actually uses a dynamic array, but for the point of this, it doesn't really matter. All we know is that we just use it, we put data in there, and it works. Behind the scenes, these are two totally different ways of storing information, and they both have their pros and cons. So you'll quickly realize that the reason there are so many different options is because they're all optimized for different things. You might wanna use a linked list in certain situations, and you might wanna use a dynamic array in certain situations. So don't let it scare you if you see a bunch of different ways to store data there's arrays, dynamic arrays, linked lists, queues, stacks, and it just goes on and on. And for algorithms, just an algorithm to sort data, there's like a quadrillion of them. You know, there's bubble sort, there's insertion sort, and you can find lists and figure out which ones are best for what scenarios. So if there are so many different options for algorithms and data structures, there's gotta be a way to measure which ones are good and which ones are bad for certain things. This is where the concept of big O notation comes in. It's basically a system to measure performance for different algorithms and data structures. So I mentioned there might be 40 different sort algorithms. Well, one might be faster than the other. So let's take a break from all this crap and take a look at big O notation. And it is a very mathy subject. I'm not going to get too much into the math. I'm primarily going to focus on giving you what you need to pass a computer science class or to develop a career in software development. So let's go over that now. Before we talk about the notation on how to decide which algorithms are faster, let's just go through a simple example and say you are standing right next to your friend. So this is you, you're hideous and I'll be your friend in this scenario. So this is me and this is you. And right now you're super, super close together. I mean, we could practically hold hands. We're not going to, but I'm just saying we're pretty close. And let's say we start walking together. So we're walking this way. Now you might not be able to see it here, but it might be the case that I'm just walking at a slight angle this way. So let's say that's the case and I'm walking this way and you're walking straight. At the start, it doesn't really matter because we still stay pretty close together. But imagine we take one quadrillion steps. Well, at that point, we're gonna be so, so, so far away from each other that we no longer could even see each other. This concept is very important to understand with algorithms because when we're working with really, really small amounts of data, that's like working up here. And which algorithm you choose doesn't make a whole big difference it's better that it just works correctly. However, when you start growing your data to very, very large, like thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of pieces of data, well now it makes a very, very big difference. If an algorithm is slower than another algorithm, you're probably not gonna notice with a very small number of pieces of data. It's kind of like just taking a few steps next to me, but just slightly different angles. But that difference is going to be extremely obvious as we increase the size of the data. So as a computer scientist, it is your job to basically figure out different classifications of these algorithms. Some being pretty slow, some being 
just drop my chalk. Some being extremely fast, some being somewhere in the middle. And again, as a reminder, with small data sets, you're not gonna see a huge difference, but as that data set grows and grows and grows, the difference is going to be extremely different. Another way you can think about it is, oh my gosh. Dude, seriously, I just dropped and broke another piece of chalk. It's like four now. So I wanna go through a very simple example. And to do this, I want to imagine that we have some data. So let's create an array, which is basically just a bunch of pieces of data together in memory. And I'm just gonna put some data in here. And now I tell you, hey, I want you to get the very last element in this array. Well, it's probably fairly simple. The last one is this one here. If you know how much memory each one of these numbers takes up, you can just jump to that position in memory. That's because these are all sequential in memory. You start here and you just say, oh, whatever this size is, multiply it by five, and boom, you're here. So you can get this number for me very quickly. Now let's say, here's a different example. Instead of using an array, we're using a linked list. This is structurally different and we're gonna do videos dedicated to linked lists here soon. But in this situation, the data is not connected. Instead, they are separate and they point to each other. The first one points to the second one, the second one points to the third one and so forth. Well, because these are not all together in a line inside of memory, in order to get this piece of data, you actually have to start here, go to the next element, go to the next element, next one, and then the next one. So it actually took us five different operations. Whereas this one, you just jumped right to the end and you were done. So with a data set of only five members, it doesn't even make a difference because computers are so extremely fast. It's just going to get that data almost instantaneously. You're not even gonna notice. But if instead we had 10 million pieces of data, starting at the very beginning and going all the way to the very end is going to take a whole lot longer than just automatically jumping to the end. So this one is in a whole different class of speed than this one. So how would we actually write that? What's the notation to say the speed of this thing? Well, what's the operation we're trying to do? We're trying to retrieve data. And for the operation, we assume the worst case. So at the very end. So we're trying to retrieve data and this one is an array. So for an array, the way we would write this is O and then in parentheses, a one. So this is the classification for retrieving data from an array. Another way to say this is it's constant time. Now let's take a look at the same thing with a linked list. Well, in this situation, to get that fifth element, we actually had to go five times. So it's whatever the size of the list is. And if you say n is the size, in this situation it's five, but we're being more general here. We're saying n is the size of the list you would say O of N. So retrieving data from an array is big O of one. Retrieving data from a linked list is big O of N. There are other classifications of algorithms as well. So there is N squared, which is really bad. There's N factorial, which is like worst case scenario. That is absolutely horrendous. Then there are other ones such as log N, these classifications are only noticeable as the data size increases. So for example, n factorial, this is going to get extremely, extremely slow. In this situation, if you had 100 elements, an n factorial algorithm would be 100 times 99 times 98, all the way down to one. And whatever the final answer is, that is how long it would take. That's how many operations it would take. So as the size increases, 
this one just gets extremely, extremely large. So we're gonna focus on this junk a little bit more in the next video. The main thing I wanted to share with you guys is that there's different classifications of algorithms and different data structures sometimes require different ways of doing things. In this situation, the linked list required O of N here in order to grab that last element. Now, when you are doing interview questions, you'll often be asked about optimization. So that's what I wanna talk about now. All right, so you just finished your interview for a senior software engineer at Google and you developed a linked list and they want you to grab that last element. And you do, and you can clearly tell that it is O of N. And they say, we need you to optimize this. How can you make this more efficient? We don't have time for O of N. We're Google, we're processing unlimited data here. Well, this is where you use your brain power, but there's often different things you can do. It might be a small trade-off, but the reward is very significant when you're working with large amounts of data. Here's the solution. So often when you have a linked list, you're going to have a pointer to the start. That way you know how to get the data. If you wanted the fifth element, you'd go to the start and you would just go to the fifth element one at a time there. If you're regularly going to be grabbing that last element or appending data, then you can keep a pointer to the end. And now to grab that last element, you just get the value of end and you're done. So you just brought this from O of N down to O of one. So you brought it from dependent on the list size to a constant time algorithm. Very, very awesome. So the downside here is you have to have another pointer. You no longer just have start, you also have end. But that is a small consequence to save so much time when you're appending data to this list. All right, so the big O, that is a way to measure complexity. We talked about classifying algorithms by the different complexity. You could also classify them by different things, such as implementation. So you could create an algorithm to process data recursively, or you can make it iterative. There are also other optimizations you can do, such as dynamic programming. If you want a taste of some other stuff when it comes to data structures and algorithms, there are trees and graphs. So a tree is basically nodes that are connected and you can create algorithms to process or basically traverse this tree. There's also graphs, which are very similar to trees. It's just not necessarily in that same structure. So we can have them pointing all kinds of places. And a good example of this might be, imagine a map. These are the major cities, you know, and you want to create an algorithm to go from Los Angeles up to New York City. Well, there's a ton of different paths you could take. So let's say we wanted to create a GPS app to tell you how to get from Los Angeles to New York City. Well, that app is going to have to analyze the different paths to these different cities, which one's going to be the shortest or which one's going to be the most highway or avoid tools or whatever it might be. And you need to make that decision algorithmically to tell the driver where to go. These are the kinds of things algorithms do. They are tightly paired with data structures because oftentimes the data structures contain the information that the algorithms process. Without this data structure here, there would be no algorithm to follow a path. It wouldn't make sense. So that's why algorithms and data structures are, are so close together. Whew. So it looks like I tried to cram an entire semester in one video, which we can just know is not possible. So stay tuned for the next video because we're going to get into some more information